afraid of? Well, Dave, I want to start off, I'll answer your question, but I want to start off with the fact that there's nothing more powerful than the truth, not your truth or my truth, but the truth. And the truth is that all fiat currencies reach their intrinsic value of zero, or in other words, they fail at some point. So that's the truth. And knowing that as a basis or foundational argument, then why were they worried? Well, they know that. The bankers know that if they go off onto this uh, fiat-only system, and Nixon did a great job of selling the idea that it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States, and we're temporarily closing the gold window, and all this nonsense, because France had caught on to the game, and they were sending all kinds of fiat, or I should say, redeemable currency back to the United States and taking it out in gold. And they saw a run on the gold supply, and they had to do it. So... The reason I went into the derivatives market is the supply of gold is a relatively precious commodity. Uh, but if you make a bunch of paper gold, there's an infinite supply. So now you have an ability through the futures market to control or, let's say, manage the price of gold. And you can do that by getting your buddies, in other words, in the central bankers that have a large gold supply, to feed the required amount of physical in the market, but most of it is done on a derivatives basis, meaning settlement was done in paper. In most commodities, there's only about a 2% that's actually taken in the physical commodity, and that's not just gold. That's wheat, that's uh, soybeans, that's soybean oil, that's uh, cotton or cocoa or coffee or any of the commodities. There's a huge amount of speculation and quote-unquote hedging that goes on in these markets that are all done through derivatives only, and the underlying physical asset is a very minor part of what actually takes place. Most people don't know that, but that's the way it's been for a very long time. Now, let's say they didn't create the paper market, and they just let gold be the way it is, and silver, and they didn't do anything with it. And they continually created the currency like they've been doing, printing and printing and printing. What would the gold market look like today? What would the silver market look like today? And how would that affect the central bankers? Well, if there was, uh, you're saying there wasn't a derivatives market. Yeah, let's say they didn't have it. Let's let's just go on the assumption, you know, the, the whole theory that they, they, could, they didn't do it. What right. Would, so you'd have a cash market only. And that's a very good market because it's much more of a free market. If, if that were the case, in theory, can't be proven because we haven't been on that, you would have a cash price for gold and silver that would be pretty close to the increase of the M1 money supply, which means if you take the amount of M1 and you divide it by the amount of gold that the Treasury purportedly says it has, which is 261 million ounces, you've got <clears throat> this many you know, billions of dollars out there in the M1, not M2 or M3, you would come to the dollar price of gold. And that would give you a price right now of around 13000 I think, the last time I did it. And then for silver, it's much more difficult because silver was basically demonetized in 1965. And you could cash in silver certificates through 1968. So any of your well-knowledgeable uh, uh you know, commenters can comment on that. I'm well aware of that fact. But silver is a little tougher because it's been demonetized for so long. But, you know, if you go to the classic ratio or the monetary ratio, it'd be 15 to 1. So the market would also determine that. So in a cash market, you would be much, much closer to gold monitoring the increase in the M1 money supply. That's what would take place. From from the central banker's point of view and from the people's point of view, what what would the fiat currency, I mean, pe when people look at it and they say, okay, wait, gold is at 13,000, you know, silver's, you know, whatever it is, 500, 600, 700, and the fiat currency is out there at the same time. How would people look at the fiat currency? Would they say, oh, wow, this is great. It's great to own a dollar. Or would they look at it completely differently? Well, Gresham's law would take hold, as you know. So what would happen is people would save in physical gold and silver and they'd spend the fiat basically as fast as they can. The problem is psychology. I mean, this, and I'm going to digress here, Dave, and bring me back if I get lost. But this is the whole idea of long-term capital management. I mean, they had some pretty smart guys that wrote the wrote the software. And basically, they thought they could predict human behavior. And you can. 
for quite a while, but you can't predict it 100% of the time, and that's where the rub comes. So what I so with that foundation, the important point is to know that once the gold price was set free, meaning that there was a cash price only, people will get excited to see what's coming. They understand, oh, every time the money supply is increased, that means that the dollar's worth less because gold's constant. So the dollar price would go up and they would get excited and probably overshoot the market, which means that instead of being uh, a direct you know, arithmetic problem I just outlined where you'd figure out how many dollars are out there versus gold and come out to a number, it would overshoot that number because people would say, oh, they're going to continue to do this and look out. I could, you know, forecast five years from now, the dollar's going to be worth hardly anything. I better get as much gold as I can now, which you put a higher, you know, demand on gold supply, silver as well, and you see them overshoot their theoretical equilibrium point. So that's what would happen. And I just want to give people uh, just an idea of how gold maintains its value. If we go back to 1914, the price of gold was about $20 per ounce, and it had maintained this value for decades. The average price of a house in 1914 was around $3,500 or 175 ounces of gold. The average price of a house today is around $225,000, $250,000. The same 175 ounces will purchase you that house because that 175 times the $1,300 per ounce today is around $227,000. So it maintains its value. I mean, and this is the manipulated value. And if what you were saying, if gold was unmanipulated, non-manipulated, it would be around 13,000. So 175 ounces would buy you multiple houses today. Um, and that's how bad uh, fiat currency is. So gold and silver basically keep their value as the fiat currency continually loses its value. Well, that's a very excellent point. I think that's really important for everyone to think about because what you really want to do when you price gold is to price it into something else, not necessarily dollar, because we're brainwashed into thinking dollars have value. And, you know, and that's just the basic premise of the whole banking system. But if you look at it in terms of how much is it buying oil or gasoline or automobiles or houses or something tangible that's really there, then that's a great way to look at it. So that's one way to really think about, you know, what is the gold that I bought at you know, whatever price and maybe higher than it is today, but is it, is it doing its job? And the answer is absolutely it is. And the second thing to think about is that it's mispriced in dollars in a horrific manner, because if we went back to this idea of the cash price of gold and it actually called, blew the whistle, let's say, as a metaphor, blew the whistle as a cop on the street and said, you know, everyone's attention is like, look, we're calling fiat farce, you know, as you said, totally phony, false, and I forget how you say it, but it's, it's, it's fabricated yeah. false and phony. And the gold price would indicate how badly the people have been taken for a ride based on the banker's ability to counterfeit everybody and they have an exclusive right. Another important point, I think every one of your viewers and listeners know this, but it's not that the government, you know, prints money. The government borrows money printed by the Treasury that's controlled by the Federal Reserve, which is a private bank. So you're making these private bankers rich. And, you know, people say, oh, it's OK, we owe it to ourselves. No, it's owed to a private banking consortium. That's who it's owed to. And they basically control all governments planet wide, with the exception of like North Korea and Iran and Cuba. Some of these, you know, real black, you know, very hostile nations purportedly. So it's money is power. They have the power. They have the control. And they're doing everything within their means, meaning derivatives, markets, and propaganda to keep that paradigm alive because they don't want to see anything that usurps their power, which could be cryptocurrencies, precious metals, uh, people creating their own. I'm all for competing currencies. I'm very much against this banker control mechanism that's been in place for so long. 
You know, it's funny you mentioned cryptocurrencies because it looks like they're doing the same thing they did with gold and silver, two cryptocurrencies. They created a paper market. They're out there demonizing cryptocurrency. The same thing they, you know, they tell us about gold and silver. They're barbarous relics. You don't really need it. Why do you have it? They're, they're, it's not really money. And they're doing the same thing with crypto, It's but they're taking a different path. They're saying criminals use it, terrorists use it. You shouldn't have it. It's very volatile. And you can see they're preparing and getting ready to try to control the crypto market with the paper market, just like they did with the precious metals market. It looks like they're doing the same exact thing because they're very afraid of, like you said, other currencies competing with theirs. Absolutely. If you go back, and for those that don't know, uh, there's a film out there, documentary called The Four Horsemen Film. If you Google The Four Horsemen Film, uh, you'll see it. And in the beginning of that movie, Julian Tennant, who's the uh, Financial Times editor, chief editor, very bright woman. And she talks about the cognitive map, which means the way you think. And so she says, if you can control the cognitive map, then you've got them. In other words, we're talking about the same topics you and I are discussing, like what's wrong with the financial system, what's wrong with the monetary system, and <clears throat> what's controlling it. And so it's going back to what you said about crypto. If you could control the way people think about it, then you've basically got them. It's a psychological move, really, because if people that were, let's say, on the fence, like, well, maybe I'll buy some crypto or maybe I'll hedge or you know, I like this one, this one's gold backed, or I like this one because it's based on uh, Chinese tea or whatever, whatever their motivation. But now they get a push from the other side saying, oh, only terrorists use it or, you know, some scare tactic. It's going to discourage any new buying into that. And once you discourage new buying, the market will flatten out or start down. The only way any market goes up or down is buying pressure or selling pressure. So if all the people that are in the crypto are in, let's say all the way, and there are no new buyers, it's going to stagnate. Do you see uh, crypto currencies merging with gold and silver where people will look at it and say, OK, this is backed by silver or gold? Well, it's already happening and I'm associated with uh, uh, silver backed crypto. Uh, for those that are interested, you can go to HT2 https colon backslash backslash ag dot load l o d e dot o n e but i think now this is me and i am not this in the cryptos but i think that that could be the next step there's a big problem with cryptos in general not all of them but uh, the majority of them i'll say 80 percent of them which is trust and that's always the problem with fiat currency is how much do you trust this stuff so people trust something with intrinsic value. And so you can back a crypto with, as I said, wood or cotton or cobalt or tea or whatever. But you also do it with the, the best money of, you know, that the world has voted on, which is, you know, gold and silver for thousands of years. So I think it could not would, but could be the next step in the crypto world where you're starting to see more people that were hesitant to get into it because they had resistance to the fact of, well, what's this crypto really mean? Yeah, it's limited or it isn't limited. Uh, but wow, now I know what it could do. It can provide me with a means that's outside of the system and also backed by something tangible that's been you know reliable for thousands of years. So I think it could be the next step up in the crypto space. Time will tell. I just wanted to move out to uh, China and Russia. Uh, I mean, they've been accumulating a lot of gold. China's been dumping treasuries. They've Russia and, and China have been creating their payment system, which duplicates the SWIFT system. They have a gold-backed trading system. They recreated the exchanges out in the east. And Hungary right now is asking for their gold back. And... You know, all this is happening at the same time. And also we have the introduction of the Petro Yuan. I mean, when you look at this, do you, what do you see happening here? Wh why is all of this happening right now? Well, to go back a couple of steps, if you look at, you know, the formation of the BRICS and Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and taking away or moving away from the SWIFT system, all this, this is because... Those two nation states, or let's say the BRICS in total, know exactly what I said at the beginning. You know, only the truth works, and the truth is all fiats fail. 
So since the reserve currency is the dollar, it is failing as we speak. In all practical purposes, it's failed. It's just that the market hasn't woken up to that fact yet because the bond market is still sky high. So the, the, those countries, particularly Russia and China, by the way, as an aside, Russia's total gold holdings on an official level uh, just uh, became number one over China. In other words, uh, purportedly the U.S. has the most gold, but I question that. But as far as between China and Russia, China, uh, Russia now has more uh, on the books gold than China does. So they have moved away from the dollar slowly and surely, continue to get the best anti-dollar asset that is available, which is gold. They continue to accumulate it. All gold mined in China stays in China. Most of the gold mined in Russia stays in Russia, and they buy more in the marketplace on top of that. So I think they all see what's coming, and that is that there will be a reset of some at some point. And whether or not they're able to free themselves in a separate uh, financial system, or let's call a monetary system or financial system, away from the Anglo-American empire remains to be determined. But they're still absolutely working in that direction with their own settlement system, with their purported with their possible gold banking, uh, gold backing, or at least partial backing of, let's say, a new currency. So they see what's coming. And yet they also know that they can't pull the plug overnight because it disrupted all the markets. So they're probably willing to let this happen on its own accord and continue to accumulate until that day. While all this is happening with Russia and China, do, do you think that the U.S. is going to lose the reserve status of, of the world? Yes. Yes, I do. I think that it's losing it as we speak. I mean, you know, if you look at China, they've gone in rather quietly and made deals with uh, gold in the ground, cobalt in the ground, you know, rare earth elements. I mean, first of all, let me again back up and build a, another foundation, but there's a saying here in the Northwest Mining Association that if it can't be grown, it has to be mined. And this is a fact. I mean, if you look at, you know, your iPhone or, you know, a box of cereal or whatever you've got, it's either something that was grown in the earth or something that's taken out of the earth. So this is the basic builder of all wealth, which means that people that are, let's say, fundamental economists, not Keynesians, but understand how real assets become more valuable with uh, labor and ingenuity, you want to have a, a strong base, which means you want to have those minerals. And so China has been going around the world, basically, and making deals with places like Africa, Brazil, South America, and other places to secure that fiat into something real and they're just basically warehousing it and i make that not as a joke i mean one of the best warehouses you can have is is mother earth itself and just hold it there for let's say a rainy day or when it's really needed or the price goes up or whatever is required so there's a big shift in thinking between the anglo-american empire that's had control and the psychological edge for so long and they become so arrogant and the hubris is so great that they think they could control everything. And they have for a very long time. On the other side, you've got the BRICS that's saying, no, we're going to get real, buy real, and be real. You know, one of my early statements when I started on the web. And that's what basically the tactic that they're taking. But they're not announcing it. you got to do a little bit of thinking to see clearly what's going on. But that's it. If, if the U.S. loses its reserve status, where do you think the reserve, I mean, is there going to be a reserve currency or is there going to be something completely different? Well, I'm certain that the powers that be have planned probably A, B, and C, if not all the way to F. I think they're, you know, prepared to take this system down and resurrect something. I mean, Jim Rickards makes a great argument about the SDR. He also says uh, in his book that it's basically the same system. It's just that the public wouldn't know that because the sales job coming from the powers that be would be so strong. That, Look, we've got this new currency. It's international. It's not a dollar. Uh, we're going to reset the system with this SDR. SDRs has gold, which is really paper gold. 
and everything's going to be wonderful again. So I don't rule that out. Uh, I think it's a possibility. But where it will go, I think, you know, I'm not bright enough or, or on the inside track to know. What I do know is that there will be a reset. And when you get into that type of unbelievable chaos for a momentary amount of time, the results are unpredictable. So I go back to the long-term capital management that I mentioned a while back, which means that the powers that be, again, being so arrogant, think that, well, we'll just do this, that, and the other thing. We'll cool the stock markets. We'll close them down for a week. We'll reissue this currency, and we'll bring it back up, and you know everybody's on our side, so to speak. When the actuality is human behavior cannot be predicted. So you don't know really what they have the ability to control and not control. And when we're talking money, we're talking about something that transcends everyone. It transcends religion, race, national origin, religious belief, sexual orientation, everything. Everyone's concerned about, quote unquote, their money. And when that's at risk and it's apparent to everybody, which most people don't even know what's going on unless you listen to a show like yours. Once it's apparent and the, you know, CNN can't deny that there's a financial reset or the stock markets are closed and the bond market's crashing and they pulled the uh, circuit breakers and, oh my God, look at it. You know, 2008 all over again, except this time uh, the cavalry can't come to the rescue. When that happens, the outcome really isn't predictable. So we have two things happening here. We have the central bank right now where they're raising interest rates, which we saw prior to 2008, where they continually raised the rates until everything started to break down, and then they started lowering them again. And I believe the new Fed president wants to raise the rates, I don't know, four to six times this year or something like that. And then we have Trump, on the other hand, who is pushing tariffs, reciprocal taxes. He wants to go to phase two with his tax plan, cutting more taxes. Uh, that people are talking about trade war. I mean, we have all this happening. I mean, are are they working together to bring down the economy? Or is the central bank and the deep state going to be bringing down the economy? Or is Trump trying to bring down or save the economy? What's your take on this? Excellent question. And Dave, believe me, from the bottom of my heart, I wish I knew. Well, maybe I don't, but I, I wish... So here's a couple scenarios, and there's probably infinite possibilities. But number one is, since the Federal Reserve basically is an illegal entity, uh, you can research that. Don't take my word for it. I mean, Trump could basically, and I'm using Trump as like the U.S. government. So it's not just about Trump. It's about the idea. But in theory, or in actuality, you could print a, you could coin, you could have the mint make a great big coin that's, let's say, uh, you know, a foot in uh, diameter and put uh, $21 trillion on it and hand it to the Fed and take it over with some armed guards over to the, let's make it out of pot metal, let's give them something valuable, and take it over to the Federal Reserve and say, we just paid off the national debt. And then issue your own currency because then you truly would owe it to yourself. In other words, the interest on the debt would be we the people, and whatever occurred there would be to build infrastructure, small business loans, whatever, and that would be controlled by the government itself. And there you would be in a system. So that's maybe a really long shot. I'm doing it to make people think. I want people to think about the way things could be rather than the way things are. And you asked me, Point blank, you know, David, what do you think? And I think, one, it's a possibility that, uh, you know, Andrew Jackson in the White House and Andrew Jackson being the last president where the national debt was paid off and he called, uh, you know, the bankers a, a den of vipers. Uh, it's a possibility. It's, it's a remote one. Uh, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but this is a thought experiment. On the other hand, you've got the powers that be that have been in place since 1913. Basically, the whole system worldwide, globally, is on this on this financial system and this monetary system created by the central banks. And they certainly, as I said in a, another interview I did recently, if they see the game getting away from them, they're liable as a metaphor to turn over the table. In other words, if you're playing chess, you and I are playing chess, and, you know, 
I'm a spoiled brat and always get my way and I control everything. And, you know, I've got this game fixed and until all of a sudden the game has changed and I'm playing against somebody that doesn't, that isn't bought and sold and owned by me. Uh, and it's a real game. Uh, I'm going to have a temper tantrum and I'm going to turn over the table. So they could do that just because they have nothing left to do. So it's either war, financial breakdown or both. And again, do they have the power or the ability to bring it back up into their hands and their control? And I say that remains to be determined. Now, I may be a little bit too optimistic, Dave. I mean, anyone that's gotten close to me knows I am an idealist. And I look at the absolute possibility of the best of the best. That, that's usually unrealistic, but it's what we should shoot for. We should never shoot for mediocre or good Good is often the enemy of the best. So you really want to perform your best at whatever you do. And certainly, if we are going to reinstitute honesty in the monetary system, my mission statement, then we want to do the absolute best by everyone. And that doesn't mean just the United States. It means on a global basis. There's a direct correlation between the degradation, the degradation or the depletion of the money supply's value and the moral structure of a society. And this is where we're at. We're in a very immoral global society that anything goes, that um, there is no God. And, you know, if there is no God, you better be living. You better believe that if there isn't and you're living your life that way, you better hope that there isn't. I mean, there is something here that the moral structure has been degraded to the point where it coincides with the, the depletion of the resource base based on this fiat system. Now, what happens if the central bank, I mean, you said we can create this coin and give it to them. What if they don't accept it? I mean, they, they look at it and they say, oh yeah, but we want gold. We want silver. We want anything but that for payment. Well, we're getting into the details. I'm a big picture thinker and I have no idea. I mean, basically, before, it, what, what if, yeah, well, it would have to be, a, it would have, to, you'd have to have, you know, the, the constitutional legal scholars there you would have to have, you know, document probably, you know, 700 pages long that explains in detail all these laws that or statutes are really not the law. The Constitution is the law. Has it been usurped in 1933 declaring bankruptcy and all that? I know all that stuff. I don't want to go into it here. But the point is that you would have to have backing to be able to do it. And you'd almost have to do it at what government does best, which is by force. But if you could build the case, you know, and, and we already know, I mean, this is tried by Kennedy, basically printing, you know, not a United States note. And of course, he was taken out for that and various probably multiple other reasons. I'm not saying it could take place. I'm not saying it would take place. Again, I'm doing it as a thought experiment. But this is something that we need to do. Uh, I want to quote <clears throat> the late, great Michael Rupert, and, and he said it best, I think, and that is unless we change the way money works, we haven't changed anything. So if we're going to go in a reset and basically the powers that be stay in control, we really haven't changed anything. In fact, we probably changed it to more, uh, you know, rich class only versus everybody else. So we need to change the way money works. And this is a, a task that whenever it seems to be tried, uh, there's dire consequences to be paid. So, I mean, it would take a tremendous amount of fortitude uh, to be able to pull this off. Yeah, because I, uh, what I was saying is that I don't think the central bank would go and disappear that easily. Like, oh, yeah, thank you for the for you know the repayment. Everything's good. I, I don't think they would go for it because they they don't care about that. They, 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 they like the control. They like the power. They, they like you know, having the ability to control governments. And I don't think they ever want to go away. I, I think, just like you said, I, I think they would go to the extreme to keep their power um, along with the deep state and the rest. I, I don't think they would just disappear. Right. Just to be clear, I wasn't implying that, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, they'd accept that at all. I'm just saying that the theory could take place. But, you know, obviously there's uh, people that have tried and basically paid for it. Like I said, the only one that's really pulled it off is Andrew Jackson. And, uh, you know, it wasn't too long after that the bankers got back in control. So, you know, here we are again. Yeah. I mean, Rand Paul, I mean, he's trying again. He's trying. I mean, his father did it, too, trying to push the audit the Fed bill. I think that probably is the right approach 
to go in and expose the central bank by auditing them. I mean, there's a reason why they don't want to be audited. But if they can get that passed, I do believe that most likely Trump would probably go with it because he does have Andrew Jackson hanging in his office. And I think they would go down that path of trying to show that, you know, the central bank is a complete corrupt organization and to show the American people, to show the world how bad it really is. Yeah, and it'd have to be well thought out, much better than I'm doing here. I mean, probably you would have to have two quote unquote dollars. You'd have to allow the system to use the Federal Reserve note, their their currency, and then issue United States notes simultaneously until one dispelled the other one. I mean, you know, there's a lot to think about here. I'm not even saying it's a real solution. It's more of a thought experiment, but I want people to wake up and understand that government doesn't print the money. Government borrows the money and that enslaves everyone. So where do you see um, the deep state, the central bank? Where Where is that time period where they say, okay, we're going to take down the system because we're so backed into a corner uh, that this is our only alternative. At what point do you see that happening? I don't know a time. What I do know is a kind of a place, and that is based on like the movie Rollover that I used to show very often in my in the early part of my speaking career. And that is when the bond market starts to fall where the big players, the banks themselves, don't trust the U.S. dollar. When they don't trust the U.S. dollar, then there'll be massive bond sales. And when that takes place, the game is over. We've already probably seen, excuse me, the peak in the bond market. But these interest rate hikes are are almost meaningless. Yes, they mean something. I don't want to be too dismissive, but you're talking, you know, 0.25%, 25 basis points. I mean, these are ridiculously small and really have some effect. But there's no way that you could raise interest rates to what I consider to be nominal for a functioning system, which would be, let's say, 7%. If you got to that level, you wouldn't be able to pay the interest on the national debt. So there's a lot of problems ahead of us. I'm sure the back rooms are working uh, diligently to come up with a solution that keeps the bankers in control. And there's a huge price to pay. And on that price to pay, I just wanted to remind everybody that, you know, the Declaration of Independence, you know, the whole thing revolved around the start, which was basically that, you know, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands, which have connected them with another and assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and the nature's God entitle them. In other words, natural law which is really the paramount of everything for everyone on the planet. So if you go down and read the whole thing at the end of it, of course, it says that <clears throat> and support of this declaration with a firm reliance upon the divine providence, we mutually pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Now, what most people don't know is that when they were talking about their sacred honor, the signers were not worried of their fortunes. They, that wasn't sacred. Their lives were not sacred. What was sacred was that they realized that if this came to an armed revolution, the most important sacred thing that endured would be the ideas, belief, and faith that form the philosophical heart of what we call freedom. That's what it's all about. So this is something I kind of like to end with. Uh, I absolutely uh, always relish everything that you do, Dave. I certainly recommend you to a lot of people that follow my work that they should listen to the X-22 report. You have great guests, great thinkers, and you're one out there fighting for what is the most important thing. And it's not how much, you know, how big your stack of silver is or how much food you've got stored. It's the idea of freedom for everyone. And we're losing it. We continue to lose it. We're being usurped by these algorithms that look at what we think, do, and say and try to control it. And really, I'll end with what I started with. There is nothing more powerful than the truth. And I'm still working hard on my part to get that to everybody that will listen.